Okay, uh, welcome everybody. This is a seminar webinar on uh, anti-casualization hosted by the University of Leeds, uh, UCU. And we're very grateful to Ben Ralph, who is currently president of the University of Bath UCU branch for coming to present on uh, where they are with their anti-casualization agreement and how they got there. So thanks very much, Ben. Feel free to share your screen and take it away. Great. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction and for the invite. Um, also, thanks for Xanthi, who set this up originally, but um, <laughs> is very much occupied with other things at the moment, I believe. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, actually, it was really helpful getting this invite because it helped me kind of organize my thoughts around the anti casualization deal. Um, I think the first thing I need to start with is, is a massive caveat, which is that I only took over as branch president in May, and this deal was signed in March 2023. So um, I do not take any credit. Um, a lot of work was put in by my two predecessors, uh, David Moon and Michael Carley. Um, so uh, yeah, I just want to be really clear about, you know, kind of um, <laughs> attribution here. Um, I mean, I was tangentially involved in some negotiations, but really this is other people's work, which um, I'm kind of presenting as a kind of, but also kind of collective um, uh, work towards uh, this deal. Um, so when I start thinking about how to talk about this, I think, I think, what was really essential was kind of giving a sense of the history that led up to this because it was a, a really long process um um which led up to the, the deal we signed in, in march 2023 um which started at least five years ago um i think the first event which we need to talk about is um it happened back in 2017 actually so six years ago oh what's that it's exactly six years ago or roughly um yeah exactly six years ago there we go um so Basically, what happened, I don't know if any of you were aware of it at the time, but there was, we used to have the highest paid vice chancellor in the country, um, Glynis Breakwell, um, who was forced to resign after a, an amazing mass campaign with staff, students, um, local press, uh, local politicians, national politicians. It was amazing. I, I was part of a student occupation, which was as a PhD student back then. Um, it was kind of my entry point into kind of UCU politics. Um, and I really started on a high. Um, I haven't had too many of those since, unfortunately. Um, and this really set the tone for industrial relations at the University of Bath. We went from a manager who was basically dictatorial, autocratic, um, didn't really talk to the unions, didn't listen to them, certainly, um, to uh, a new regime. Um, and in fact, actually, the, the, the kind of um, regime in between the, her and the new vice chancellor, Ian White, was actually very important, too. Um, and that's where we started making a lot of progress on local negotiations. So it's just kind of crucial context to understand what's going on at Bath is that the, the current managerial regime know that the previous lot were kind of booted out after, you know, protests which even involved kind of chucking biscuits at um, council chambers. It was really quite something. Um, and then uh, following on the heels of that, literally a couple of months later, was the first USS strike. Um, this was the one which was kind of, again, quite a bit of a sort of, I mean, in hindsight, maybe not so much, but sort of at the time felt like a real success. Um we took part in that because we hit the 50% turnout. Um, and so plus in that, and then um, the, I think the deal came a couple of months later. Um, and then also we hit our 50% um, turnout because th this is when the ballots were disaggregated. So each university branch needed to kind of hit the 50%. The we got 50% in 2019. Um, and then of course, over the last two years, we had a series of aggregated ballots um, where we were on strike various points between December 21 and March 23. Um, and I wanted to kind of talk about this background because I really want to be clear here that it's not that kind of we made progress on anti-casualization because we weren't striking or, or kind of because, you know, we weren't busy organizing picket lines or anything. Um, in fact, if you look at lots of dates when we made advances in anti-casualization, it was exactly when we were on strike and striking kind of um, accelerated the progress and, and kind of focused minds. Um, so our, our, the first claim was sent to management back in October 2018, but this was kind of after um, preparing the ground in the year before that. So in the context of the resignation of the vice chancellor, and, and we knew there was an opening basically. Um, a joint statement of intent was signed in February 2019. Um, that was kind of leading off the, the initial claim. Um, I, I think that can be seen as kind of surfing off the wave of the first two bullet points there. Um, and then a second statement um, was signed during during strike action. So it's kind of part of a local deal to kind of um, 
you know, sort of show that we're making local progress on on this was uh, by this time it was the four fights of which one of those was anti casualization in in March twenty twenty, um, and then, um, yeah, so that that that's in that third period of uh, strike action, and then the final agreement is signed after you know an intense couple of years of strike action in March twenty twenty three. Um, actually just before the map starts um so kind of culminating that um, i mean it was already kind of well in progress um by by this time you know I, I think we originally got the drafts around six months before that but it was in the context of very high levels of strike action so yeah the first thing i want to say is that there's no kind of um there's no kind of choice between kind of either strike action or local negotiation the two almost always go hand in hand um and then I want to talk about, so there's a big, the kind of the big prominent agreement was in March, 2023, but actually there were a number of precursors, which kind of uh, broke some ground. Um, also kind of, you know, showed that we could kind of make sort of smaller agreements with management, um, which kind of made the, the kind of bigger agreement more, feel more possible. Um, a really big one was in 2019, um, where it was a kind of fairly technical thing, um, but um, it was reclassifying all teaching fellows as lecturers teaching, brackets teaching. Um, and really what this did is that it kind of gave them full academic status. Um, in practice, what this meant, there's there's one side which is kind of, uh, they're fully under the kind of disciplinary and kind of um, related processes related uh, in the kind of academic section, whereas before they, they weren't, which gives the full kind of uh, rights to sort of rely on notions of academic freedom, which I think is quite important. Um, I guess probably the more directly um, relevant thing to most staff was that the promotion routes were aligned with other teaching research academics um, and in fact introduced the uh, formalized routes to get to professor as just teaching only so it's kind of it, it increased career prospects for um, teaching only lecturers um, I actually I started my job current job which is lecture teaching um, in 2020 so benefited from this I think my contract was changed six days into my job which was quite nice um, and then I haven't, there's not a single date here because it's kind of rolled out in phases, but, um, and we'll see more of this later. Uh, there was a scheme to convert PGRs who were teaching at least 0.1 FTE, so roughly above 3.7 hours a week, uh, 3.75 on average 3.75 hours a week, onto what are called low fractional contracts. Um, so basically, um, fractional contracts, which are low fractions rather than high fractions. Um, Basically, you're given things like holiday pay, spine point increases year on year, um, and just a, a kind of more uh, solid employment rights compared to um, variable hours contracts. Um, this was kind of patchily rolled out across the, the university. Um, and then I've got another point which isn't directly related to anti-casualization, but I think it's an important context. Another thing we kind of managed to negotiate, which is, is again, quite sector leading, I think, which is a professorial pay scheme. Um, so basically a formalized way of grading and then um, uh, portioning paid to professors um, basically extending the grade system up into the professor ranks rather than whereas before it was a kind of much more informal system where a kind of small group of people decided to pay or professors pretty much you know on a case-by-case -case basis um, and, and and that's actually what we were kind of focusing on in 2022 um, which is why the anti-casualization agreement came a year later once that was kind of put to bed okay so that's the kind of context um, both in terms of like organization, but also kind of precursor agreements. Um, and sort of offense, I spend a few slides actually going through what is actually in the anti casualization agreement. Um, uh, I've kind of basically taken the text and, and, and brought out a few highlights. Um, so the first highlight I want to um, uh, mention is in the kind of first section, which is actually kind of mainly summarizing some things that should have already been done. Um, but this is actually explicitly saying something which was sort of informal practice, but kind of putting it on paper for the first time, which is that the university committing to making the standard fixed term contract for two years or more. Um, however, I would notice, I would note that this kind of condition of unless external funding or local circumstances makes this inappropriate. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this later, but we've actually found that in lots and lots of situations, um, people are still being given less than two years because basically this local uh, external funding or local circumstances covers a lot of cases. Um, and this is basically due to the way that like uh, budgeting is done in departments and faculties. It's a bit technical, but I think it's good to have this on paper, but I think in practice, it's not as 
um, there's not been the kind of dramatic sea change that we might have hoped for. Um, a highlight in the third uh, section three is, so this is around um, postgraduates who teach. Um, this is again, kind of summarizing stuff which has already been sort of partially implemented uh, and rolled out, but kind of making it formal policy for the whole university, um, which is around the fractional contracts for um, PhDs who teach. Um, basically, if if you go above that 0 0.1 threshold, then you, you should be offered um, a fractional contract. Typically, they don't have uh, GTOs don't have to take them. Um, it's the option to take uh, a fractional contract. Um, some choose to just continue working variable hours, um, and also acknowledging reasons why the rollout wasn't as smooth as um, as uh, we hoped a couple of years ago. Um, things like you know departmental culture and and bad communication by um, central management of, of the benefits of, of these contracts. Um, and then I, I include this, it's a bit technical, I know, but I want to include this because actually one of the really positive things we did is that there are a number of PhDs who have a stipend, which is connected to um, a commitment to borrowing and teaching. And through this anti cash negotiations, we managed to basically uh, sort out the, the contractual arrangements around that, uh, which weren't... Um, one correctly set up before um and and get them onto the correct contract so it's kind of a little technical thing but uh, you know sort of did possibly um affect quite a number of phds there so the fourth section then goes on to fractionalization of part-time hourly paid lecturers so these are not gtas but people who have um basically when we use hourly paid uh lecturing and contracts it's basically the same principle but with a higher threshold of 0.2 fte so anyone who's employed on a kind of Casual basis, so hourly paid, if they exceed that 0.2 FTE, then they should be offered a low fraction of contract. So you can kind of see a theme here, which is kind of bringing people on who are working in a casual way, if they exceed a certain threshold, bringing them into um, a kind of fixed term contract, um, squeezing out kind of zero hours of contracts, essentially. Um, and, and also giving them full academic status of lecture, senior lecture. Um, and then um this section five a little bit technical but i think quite important and this is really um where a lot of the kind of difficulty in implementation um lies and, and i think it's quite which is why we wanted to include this language um which is that a lot of the kind of uh reasons that people get short contracts or, or kind of insecure contracts is basically because of the the constraints of resource planning and budgeting in, in departments and faculties. So again, a bit technical, a bit wonky, but I think this it's a really important to kind of drill down into the details of how uh, budgeting is done to sort of when when um, you know hiring for new staff is done, um, and essentially there's language around commitment to try and sort of when uh, say a certain funding stream runs out for one staff instead of sort of just making them redundant and and hiring someone new. On a, on a new contract, there's more um, internal redeployment done, um, and yeah, I think I think that language there speaks to a kind of combination of technical and policy changes. So it's a kind of sort of ratcheting up, um, improving the practice of of kind of uh, giving out better contracts at, across the departments, across the faculties, so that the kind of general status um, improves. Um, and this ties into the more. This is probably the. The real headline of the whole agreement actually um uh section six and um, this is specific to research staff at the moment um and uh what this this section does is it delinks um specific grant funding from um individuals contracts in big research centers um well, we're starting off with two big pilots of, of, of kind of big research centers, uh, one called the Tobacco Control Group and one um, IAPS, which is around kind of mechanical, mechanical engineering um, center. Um, and this is what's really interesting and quite innovative, I think, where essentially what happens is all the grants in these big research centers are pooled, um, the resources are pooled, and then all the staff who are hired on research contracts are moved on to not contracts which are tied to a particular grant, but open-ended contracts where basically there's an ability to fund them from the pool. Um, and basically if they want to, if the, you know, if you really want to add sort of make a connection between individuals and grants, 
it means that you can move from one grant to another grant without having to reissue a contract and kind of have the you know your a fixed term contract extended to another fixed term but you can just have an open-ended contract which will be subject to you know will be subject to redundancy if the funding pool runs out if the pool runs dry but it, it really delinks the kind of individuals from individual researchers from individual grant fundings um and yeah, so we start off with a pilot in the 22-23 academic year and then another much bigger pilot in, in this academic year um, with the idea that this will be rolled out across the university next academic year should the pilots jointly be su su successful. Talk a bit more about this in a bit, but basically uh, the university and, and we deem these to be successful so far. So um, we don't see any reason why that shouldn't go ahead. Um, yeah, I think this is this is a kind of really probably exciting bit of the of the anti cash agreement, which I don't think we've seen anything like this uh, done in other universities. But if anyone else do correct us, um, and then finally, there's a section on resourcing, which I think is important, um, which is around just basically committing to prioritize resources to make sure that what the the the, the kind of aims of of the agreement can actually be implemented. Um, and again, I'll talk a bit more about this because I don't think we're completely happy that this has been met so far. Um, so yeah, so that's the kind of Brief highlights. I know there's a lot of text there. Sorry, I didn't have too much time to make this presentation. Um, uh, I can put the link in in the chat actually after this of of the whole agreement. Um, if people want to kind of read through it, it's not too long. It's about three or four pages. Um, and so moving on to kind of evaluating and and looking where we are now. So we're about six months on from the signing of it. Um, first one talk about the successes and and what we think has gone well and what what's kind of changed for the positive. Um, in our local situation. Um, yeah, I think the, the headline is the pooled research funding. Um, so this has been rolled out in two major research centres, and it's I think it's affected hundreds of staff now um, who've been moved on to kind of fixed con fixed time contracts to open ended contracts, um, and all the kind of HR surveys they're doing, and 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 uh, you know they're doing quite a lot of investigation because obviously it's quite a novel thing. It's all it's all really positive. People are happier. People are able to get things like um, mortgages because they've got fixed time, uh, they've got open ended contracts rather than fixed time contracts. Um, they just feel more secure, less want, uh, less likely to leave the university, so retention's higher. It's just looking really, really good. It, it looks like this is just a, a really sensible model going forward. Um, I think this isn't just anti-casualization. It's linked to other things, especially, you know, the the, the circumstances in which the previous vice chancellor um, left. But I think it must be noted at Bath, we, we seem to have better and more productive local industrial relations than almost any other university we know of. Um, like uh, we have a lot of access to senior management and they, the, the conversations are actually substantive. I'm not saying that, you know, we kind of sort of think well, we're not best mates. We don't kind of agree on anything. There's a sort of recognition that there's kind of different interests and that, um, that strike action is necessary. The industrial action is necessary that, you know, antagonism is necessary, but there's a kind of seriousness that we can, work together on things where there are kind of win-wins there are kind of shared interests um and actually what i would say here is that during the mab i think because of a lot of the negotiations will be done on the anti-casual and other, other things like that the professorial pay we were able to negotiate in a more tense environment but, I, but able to seriously negotiate a decent mab um, deduction deal so um, it was 40% for two months, but we managed to get 75% of that um, refunded um, in, in agreement for doing our marking after the MAB was over. So not even kind of breaking the MAB early. We didn't, we, you know, we've had a decent MAB. We, we kept going till the end. Um, but ultimately, the, the final situation was that we only got the equivalent of, what was it, 10% um, of pay for two months. So about 20% of a month's pay, which... It's not nothing, but it's 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 a lot less than other places. I mean, I, I think that was because of the the kind of situation where we could actually kind of have substantive no negotiations with management. Um, and I think it's raised expectations in the in the academic staff, and I, I do specifically mean academic staff. Um, this is an ac this is a kind of a UCU only deal. Um, we do do a lot of work with United and Unison, but um, this deal is specifically UCU, um, because it relates just to academic staff. Uh. I think it's raised expectations in terms of pe people feel empowered um, to kind of demand better in terms of their contractual relationships um, and expect more from their working conditions, um, which is good because that's what we want to do as a trade union. Um, but the, I'm not saying it's all been positive. There have been challenges as well, especially in the kind of implementation. Um, 
I think what we found is that even though a lot of the stuff in, in the agreement looked really good, a lot of uh, the problems implementing it are down to basically bad academic culture. Um, we kind of had a sort of situation where I think managers tend to be the bigger hold up now than, than HR kind of HR kind of in agreement with us on a lot of things. Um, but bad practices, I think, especially in the faculties we find rather than departments um, around how I talked about this earlier about how they kind of budget for certain roles um you know basically they 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 they're able to sort of say that every sort of case when they want to put out a one year contract falls into the kind of exceptions of uh instead of going for the two year contract um so i i think we're hoping that there can be a gradual ratcheting effect where kind of the the cult, the, the the better policy slowly changes the culture but it's been a bit of a grind and um we have had some useful con conversations with kind of more um, enlightened, let's say, uh, heads of department where they've kind of really explained the problems and, and why they found it difficult to implement a lot of the, the good parts of the anti casualization agreement. But um, it's not easy. It, you can't, agreements like this don't kind of just suddenly change conditions overnight um, unless it's more kind of super, super, uh, things like, I guess, changing uh, teaching fellows to lecture teaching. That, that was immediate because it just changed everyone's kind of contracts in that way. But um, around things like how people give out, uh, you know, what contracts are advertised, uh, what what uh, posts are advertised, um, because there's different practices in lots of different departments and faculties. I think that that's been a lot slower to change. Um, so another problem we found, and again, maybe I, I know we're recording this, but I guess this could be considered slightly um, confidential, but just don't share this irresponsibly, I guess. Um, we're quite worried that we just don't basically feel that HR has sufficient staffing levels to be able to um support departments properly and actually kind of instigate change um so there's been delays in implement policies responding to in, uh, individual concerns has taken longer and um, and it's just basically hr just doesn't seem to have the capacity to do this um it's a kind of false economy where you know they want to make savings and so they don't hire more people in hr even though it's kind of holding them up and probably making more money in lots of areas um and it's just really frustrating and and it's the kind of classic stuff we deal with in, in universities where um there's just not a lot of kind of joined up thinking about how to have a, a kind of efficient well-run organization uh, and then i put this i know i put this in the puzzle as well but i think it's also a challenge in that we've seen a big rise in casework around anti casualization and people kind of asking about their contracts and i'm not saying this is a bad thing but it has meant that our casework team have been a bit overstretched in the last few months so i think it's something to be aware of is that sometimes when you raise expectations of your members um, that does mean they kind of expect higher levels of kind of support in in um, in casework in particular. Um, so do be aware of that uh, if you're, uh, you know, think think about the impact of agreements when negotiating them on the capacities of of, of your like committee and, and your casework team, because um, mm -hmm. I think that's something we kind of didn't realise and um, are noticing now. Um, yeah, I think that's that's all. But happy to take any questions, um, clarifications, or, or kind of just conversation points um, about that. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um, that that's a really um, interesting and useful presentation. I think you know, in in the national context, lots of institutions will will see themselves reflected in that. Um, and it's a really useful case study for the rest of us to take away and show to management and particularly, you know, things like surveys of of retention prospects and so on. Those are really cast iron things that we can use to demonstrate to management that actually these changes benefit everyone. Um, it's also very timely for us here at Leeds, where we've just seen our VC resign uh, after pressure from pretty much every uh, sec section of the university um, so so that's very useful for us here as well I'm going to stop the recording there and then we can have a bit more of a um, general discussion thanks